All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Full Spectrum series. I am Nick Valentino. I'm an academic counselor and the host uh, for the series. Uh, the Full Spectrum series is, is composed of a, a s introductory lectures from Hagen faculty. Um, this is an opportunity to ask Hagen faculty about the program, um, their research, uh, and the types of challenges in the uh, field that they work to solve. Um, uh, if you'd like a chance to win a prize, we're actually doing prizes uh, in this. So if you uh, put your name in the chat or if you um, uh, put your information on the Facebook broadcast, um, if you're a current prospective alum, staff, faculty, or any other part of the university community, you would be eligible. Um, so please let us know. Uh, during the lecture, I'll, I'll be monitoring the chat uh, for questions uh, both on uh, Zoom and on the Facebook Live broadcast. So feel free to ask your your, uh, your questions. Um, coming up for the, because uh, I always do this at the end and forget to say at the beginning, coming up for our next presentation is Chemical Engineering with Dr. Mark Borisoff on October 15th. There will be information on the Facebook page about that uh, from 2 to 3 p.m. Um, but like I said, I will update everybody on that on both Facebook and Instagram. Uh, today, uh, this session is presented by Dr. Andy Berger, Professor of Optics. Uh, Dr. Uh, Berger uh, is very much involved with undergraduates um, in both instruction and advising and guiding. Uh, he's won two awards as an instructor um, and he's, he's, we're very lucky to have him here to give you sort of an overview of optics and to answer your questions. So I will turn it over to you, Dr. Berger. All right, hi everyone. Um, as Nick said, uh, I'm a professor here in the optics department. Let me just tell you who you're talking, who's being talked to here. Uh, I've been a professor here for, for a while. I joined the department about 20 years ago. And um, so I can certainly talk to people. I can answer questions about anything in the optics program. I've been on the undergraduate committee for quite a while. So if you're a prospective student interested in coming to Rochester and, and getting involved in optics, or if you are a, a first semester undergrad here, or even a second semester with the way um, things have been shuffled for some people, and you uh, are interested in learning about the, the program and whether there's a way to onboard yourself, I can certainly talk about that. There are a lot of things I can tell you about once you are an optics uh, track student, about uh, the feasibility of studying abroad, the kind of pathways that we provide you into jobs, which is a pretty singular thing about our department as people at the university know. and. Uh, and of course, I can I can talk to you about sort of what is optics, but I am I have I have slides I could show you about that, but I am gonna uh, turn it to to people who hopefully have some questions because it's a very diverse possible range of people here, and I'm not sure who wants to know what kind of things. So it can be logistics of how to get on the bus uh, if you feel like you have missed it. Don't worry, you haven't missed it, and uh, but it could be questions of all the other things I just listed. So with that, let me take a breath. And you've got, you have a lot of advisor type people here and me with the knowledge of the optics department and we will do our, we even have an alumnus, an alumna uh, listening in. So we have a whole bunch of perspectives able to uh, be given to you, but I will now pause. Can I take a question? Yeah, one of the questions that we actually were sent before um, was from a parent stating, you know, how do I, uh, get my child, what sort of information should I be giving my child to, to get more information about optics? And how do I explain this um, to someone who has never had any exposure to the field? Right, right. So, right. So most people think that optics is being good about these things. And um, that's certainly not the only thing that, that, that optics is about. So there's this, there's this large, large list. So I think, um, what I, what I will do uh, is uh, I'll show you a little slide that at least goes down sort of the standard laundry list of things that you can tell grandma at Thanksgiving about like why you're studying this subject. So let me, um, let me do that. I will, I, will bring you, I will bring you there if, um, if at all possible. So there's, always the challenge of making sure I can do it right, but I think I, I can. Gonna... It is a much less cumbersome way to explain. How do I explain this to grandma is, is I think one of the better ways to, to get, do that aerial view of the. Uh, of, of That's the right. That's right. 
<laughs> okay. Okay. Well, let me let me do my little my little standard list for you for you folks at home. So, so uh, we do a lot of we do a lot of things, and um, so one of the things that we do that you might not think about is we have a professor on the depart in the department who is super trained in studying color. I mean, we all know stuff about color in the department, but uh, that can be a profession. If you think about all of the um, devices that we all have these days, the idea of accurate color rendering or uh, you know, faithfully reproducing what you would see with your eye, or of course, uh, augmented color rendering where it's not looking, it's intentionally not looking like what you would see with your eye. Maybe you're looking at an infrared image or you're looking at an image in the visible, but you want to highlight something. So uh, there's a, a whole lot of work that goes into making these displays have the particular color rendering that you want and how to manipulate it and how to, to play with that. And of course that also gets into studying the way we see different colors. One really cool thing that's been discovered um, through work that was started here at the University of Rochester, you probably all know that your eye has like three different types of color receptors, red, green, and blue for color. And they've been able at the medical center to actually directly map how many red, green, and blue cones you have in your retina. And it turns out that people have um, kind of like an order of magnitude different ratio of one color type to another color type. And despite that, people very uh, systematically agree that the colors are about the same thing. If you show them two swatches of color, they'll agree whether they match or don't match, even though they have very different amounts of color receptors. So really cool stuff that you can do with color. Another uh, thing that people often don't think about is that all the astronomy sort of stuff that we point out at the universe and stuff that we point back down on to, to the Earth's surface, like Google Earth, there's a lot of work, of course, that has to go in optically to making excellent imaging uh, telescopes. So that's a, a big area of a lot of companies that, that work uh, to interview our students, to give them information, to, to hire them into fields. Uh, both it's, it can be a defense related thing. It can be civilian, although a lot of the things that are flying over the earth obviously uh, are somewhat associated with the government uh, in one way or another. But, uh, but we also know that increasingly they are civilian projects. So there's a lot of stuff going on out there. And uh, of course, the science of space telescopes, we're all very excited about the James Webb uh, Space Telescope being launched um, you know, very soon, which has been said for a long time, but it seems like it's truer than it used to be. So that's, that's an exciting thing that many people from the Department of Optics, the Optics, the Institute of Optics, many Institute alums are working on that project of getting that uh, satellite up in the air, operational and sending useful data back. And we have two people in our department who were on the red phone that they picked up when the Hubble Space Telescope, this is for you parents out there, when the Hubble Space Telescope was sending out blurry images, they were on the initial like, you know, what do we do now calls and we're on the task force to improve the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, this is a picture of someone's uh, retina. This is one of those mosaics I was talking uh, about where there's a uh, pictures. You can see all these dark things in the middle. Uh, there's a lot of small dots. The bright dots are actually the uh, the rod cones that are not color sensitive, but are, are more perceptive to low light levels. And then the dark regions in the interior, those are individual color sensing cones, the, the, the red, green, and blue sensors. They're not false colored here. But that's an example of the kind of single cell sensitivity that imaging can have when you shine light into someone's eye. This is actually an image that's taken with the same sort of atmospheric canceling uh, mirror adaptive optics that are used for looking through from the earth out into the skies uh, in, out into the uh, galaxies and reducing twinkle from stars that has to do with turbulence in the atmosphere. This is turbulence due to the fact that your cornea of your eye is actually always fluctuating. So this is a stabilized image, very cool technology. It's about 30 years old and, and going strong. And that's a big area that a lot of people uh, in our graduate program, as well as some of our undergrads, do a lot of research at the Center for Visual Science. Totally new thing, uh, totally different thing. Um, quantum physics places certain limits on how much somebody can interrupt a communication and not uh, betray the fact that they are eavesdropping. And there's no way on a typical telephone line that you can be fully confident that someone isn't siphoning off some of the electrons in a communication 
uh, and tapping into the signal and listening to what's being said. But uh, it turns out that if you send signals with pulses that correspond to individual photons, one photon at a time, that's a very powerful way to send a code that can't be broken. But that basically, you many of you may remember various ways of creating like a, you know, a code where you map a letter of the alphabet to another letter of the alphabet, and you can encode something that way. The point is, if you can give someone what that other what the uh, mapping is safely, then you can send them a free message without worrying about anyone else listening in because no one else is going to know the code. But sending the code safely, especially across the world, is difficult. And um, with electronic communications, it's always compromised if it's done in typical ways. So quantum is actually being used to send bank information, hundreds of kilometers, various places in the world. So uh, using, so people are now working on quantum technologies. There's people who are working on producing uh, what we call single photon sources that spit out single photons at large enough, uh, fast enough rates that you can get a lot of photons accumulated quickly, but at single uh, intervals so that you can use the single photon special properties. So. The detectors need to be developed, uh, the sources need to be de 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 developed, the ways of sending those photons over distances through optical fibers or through free space need to be developed. People have done this sending this stuff up into satellites in space. So that's a pretty cool one. Grandma would like that one. Uh, and in general, you know, optics is also being used for other aspects of quantum technology. That last thing I said was quantum cryptography. In general, photons are also participating in the field of quantum computing. Um, both for directly doing the computing with stored up photons, and I think even more so using light to do quantum manipulation on states of matter. That um, photons are really good at flying from one place to another really fast. They're not too good at persisting in your laboratory for a very long time, but they're very good at manipulating an atom, which can be held in like a magnetic trap for a very long time. So optics people are part of this whole area of like quantum technologies. And I don't think I have to convince um, I don't know about grandma, but probably your uncle is totally willing to believe that like quantum is uh, a really important thing and is, is going to be part of our future in technology. Uh, okay, so you didn't think we we're going to talk about gaming here and stuff like that, but uh, we have a professor in the department who works a lot on augmented and virtual reality. So where the optics people come in on that, uh, it, one of the ways we come in on that is that visor that you see her wearing. Uh, that the, 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 the special curvatures of those things, like you've got to somehow put the light in there, have it reflect off the front surface of the glasses and then back into your eye, right? That's, that's sophisticated stuff. And so making these special curvature things uh, is what, a, what takes you from having like a robot headgear to having something light and flexible that still gives you that, that virtual reality or augmented reality experience. And uh, so that, so, making the surfaces is part of the optics field. We're not just about generating light. We're also about making lenses and mirrors and curved surfaces that you shine the light off of in order to do things with light. So that's a huge thing to remember. Like we are about this sort of stuff too. There's no light source in my glasses, but glasses are an important part of our field. And so here's a combination where you've got a light source in the glasses that's shining the light on you. Uh, it's so that, that that's, that's a pretty, pretty neat thing. And, uh, Obviously, you all know that virtual reality and augmented reality, uh, the latter being like a surgeon who's doing surgery and is getting color coding on what you know vein to snip or something like that. These are all hugely important outside of the gaming community. But admittedly, there's been a huge commercial sector uh, wave of interest, which drives you know technologies that we can then use for the betterment of science, health, uh, culture and not, not just for the gaming community that's driven the, the desire for it. Uh, on a similar vein, um, computer chips are, you know, logic chips are increasingly trying to use photons instead of electrons to connect along various paths, like connect one part of a chip to another part of a chip. Normally that's done with electronic wires. Uh, if you have taken your high school physics, you know that if you try to cross two electrons flying in space, they're gonna, interact with each other, you know, two negative objects are going to have a repulsive force between each other. So you can't just send electrons through some hollow area and let them get from one end of one place in space to another place in space. But you can send two photons directly through each other and they don't interact with each other. They just cross through each other like, like water waves which just pass through each other on the surface of a pond and they don't destroy each other or deflect each other. So a uh, lot of good things going on these days. There's all sorts of 
nanolithography being done to make various types of uh, photonic chips. So that's a, you'll expect to see photonics replacing electronics as much as possible. We all know that a lot of information is brought into our home by fiber optic cables carrying light signals, which are much denser in information than um, straight electronic signals. But we're, we're, that doesn't yet uh, exist in large amounts at the level of chips. But I think that's everyone's working hard on making silicon-based systems that will and other novel uh, types of things that will that will do that. So these are all huge applications. Um, this is a good point, even before I get on to monitoring people's health. Looking at this list here between the photonic chips uh, and the augmented reality, you can see that Google, Facebook, uh, Amazon, Apple, Intel, like these are companies that sign up for uh, sessions that pay into a program that we have in our department to expose uh, students both graduate students and especially undergraduates to opportunities to interview with people from these companies and to get internships and eventually to get jobs. I just, I, uh, because of the pandemic, we just had our 2020 commencement exercises last weekend. And uh, one of the optics students who came back to get her degree, uh, she's working at Apple. You know, she didn't have a job when she graduated, but she, uh, that November after graduation, she got a job at Apple. So she's happily plugging away there. You know, and she can't tell me anything she's doing or she'd have to kill me. But it's that's really this is not unusual for people in our department. I just one of the PhD students who came back to get hooded also is working at Apple. So that's where people in our department go. They that we are not relegated to companies you've never heard of, you know, satellite companies and things. We're we're working for the people who put the consumer technology in your hands. I work in biomedical optics, so can't leave this list without talking about ways to monitor people's health. Um, every mother out there uh, maybe listening on this probably has had a pulse, pulse oximeter uh, monitoring their vital signs when they were uh, you know, in the delivery room. And many of the rest of you, I, generally people say that at least half the room has had a pulse oximeter clip, clipped on their finger or their toe. So um, that's just an example of something that sends light into your body and senses how oxygenated your blood is and therefore is monitoring how well your heart is delivering oxygenation to the, you know, the extremities of your body. So there's lots and lots of things. Microscopy, incredible images are being taken inside of people at um, well below the surface of your skin, seeing blood cells rushing by. There's just all sorts of things. People can shine light into your head and measure brain activity. There, there's a lot of very cool stuff that can be done with optics. And of course, that's, that's only talking about diagnostics. There's also therapeutic aspects of lasers, uh, LASIK surgery for the eye, obviously being one huge example. Uh, you can make a pretty good deal if you can remove tattoos. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things out there. So monitoring human health, huge, uh, huge area for, bio, for, for optics. And hey, you know, environmental people, the, the solar energy, I mean, we all care about it, but if you're interested in combining your interest in something highly technical in a sort of a physics engineering way, which is what optics essentially is, uh, my, my own background is I have a physics PhD and here I am in an optics department. The uh, environmentalist in you uh, might be interested in working on solar energy, and that's both about making detectors that absorb uh, solar energy, and also about making surfaces that focus solar energy the way you know you would use. We I tried to cook, you know, we sometimes cook popcorn or hot dogs by lining aluminum foil inside of like some little um, snow uh, saucer, you know, that you would scoot that fall down a hill with, and you know, like focusing light on, on a spot there, bring sunlight to a focus. So there's a lot of ways that you both can capture a uh, focus solar energy and also uh, convert it into electricity that are both parts of, of the optics field. Telecommunications, I already mentioned optical fibers carry a lot of information around. That's a big thing. Um, how many different lasers have you encountered in the last uh, day or year? You know, um, you've got the barcode scanners, you've got laser pointers, you have surgical lasers, high power lasers, high powered pulse lasers. You have the Nobel Prize in Physics from 2018, which was won by uh, two people that had been that did the work while they were both members of the Institute of Optics uh, on working on making incredibly high power pulses of light at our at the laser lab here. So there's lots and lots of ways that people are making better and better lasers. One that I didn't know about till I joined the department was that 
The main thing stopping us from having really cool laser movie projectors on the wall that are just laser scanned so they don't need to have any uh, lensing. You just sort of scan the laser across. Uh, it was that you know red lasers and blue lasers were pretty well available, but a good green laser that was modulatable quickly at raster scanning rates, that was something that was like a major area for companies to be able to develop green lasers that could be modulated fast enough for laser displays. So who knows what you might do with that. Uh, the laser lab with these huge lasers, intense lasers study the formation of stars and and, and, uh, are, and therefore they are knowledgeable about experiments involving nuclear energy. So that's a huge thing that people care about. And let me not end without mentioning again that knowing how to grind, polish and test lenses. And he said that the, all three of those are important. You've got to be able to take a hunk of glass and make it into basically the shape you want. And especially if you want to make something that doesn't look like a sphere surface, that's pretty hard. It's easy to slide something around inside of a bowl, of a, a spherical bowl, because you can wave it whatever way you want and it's rubbing the right shape. If you want to make something that looks like a more conical than that, now you can't easily do that. You got to spin it very precisely on one axis to get that. Or you got to shave it point by point, like a 3D printer sort of mindset. So grind, so making something ground um, and then and polishing it finely so that it's smooth and then testing that you've got it smooth enough. We're talking about getting things smooth to within 100 nanometers, 50 nanometers, so very, very small deviations. We have sophisticated equipment standard in the industry that allows you to make measurements like that. And often students find that's very satisfying to see if they can measure something down to a fraction of a fraction of a wavelength. And of course, I didn't mean to overlook designing. There's a lot of work that gets done. Uh, a lot of our graduates love taking lens design classes and optical system design classes. That's a big thing that people want to get hired uh, into so that you can actually design optical systems and make a rangefinder, make a telescope, make a system that makes a pulse oximeter, that makes a cell phone camera. Imagine how many cell phone cameras are sold in the world. And if you can make a slightly better one, cheaper, faster, better performance, that's gonna be huge, right? And I just said smartphone, I don't need to say it again, right? And there, there's our Nobel Prize winner from our department. She was the first year graduate student in our department and she won her Nobel Prize for work that she did when, when she was there. So that's a, that was a big list of cool stuff that you can do with optics. And I am gonna ask if Katie Schwartz, who's on this call is willing, she said she was, she volunteered that she was, to step in and say, as an alumna, what she's ended up doing with her optics degree. Are you willing to say a minute, Katie, what you do? Hi, sure, I'll come and be social. I was <laughs> hoping to, <laughs> I was uh, hoping to lurk off in the background, and then when I popped up, and my name's Katie Schwartz across, and I'm like, well, that's going to be hard to hide. With that's going to be easy to recognize. <laughs> so, hi, yes, uh, I've been in the, well, I graduated out of U of R in 08, and then uh, did my master's in Arizona in 2010. Um, I'm in the office right now. This is enough. This is a design center. <laughs> It's real exciting. On a, it's real exciting on a Friday during COVID. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I did. I came down to Arizona to do my master's. I focused on optical mechanics, uh, and then I joined Edmund Optics, which is where I've been with for the past eleven years. Which I can't believe that's kind of crazy. Um, uh, Dr. Berger was my professor well, uh, for one of my courses or two. Um, so basically, I did optical and mechanical design for the for about ten of those eleven years. Um, Edmund Optics is a, a global company that supplies a lot of different markets. So some companies kind of focus in one specific market. Uh, I had the fun opportunity to work on things that were for um, biomedical optics, for defense, uh, for uh, factory automation and robotics. Um, the autonomous vehicles industry has been a very hot area to be in optics over the past uh, few years. Um, so I've kind of got to um, touch a lot of different things. This past year, I moved uh, in the middle of COVID into uh, management. So now I um, design a number, uh, I manage a number of our optical and optomechanical designers in the group. And I focus on things like making sure we have updated software and resources, um, making sure that we're continuing education for everyone, um, getting new skills as you know, new requirements come in, customers ask for harder and harder things that, uh, you know, that are we get done faster and at lower costs, which is always the, <laughs> the trade-off. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's what I've been doing. And um, yeah, I don't know, anything else? Uh, 
Thank you. We just wanted sure. getting a, getting a testimonial is always good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'll drop I'll drop my um I'll drop my LinkedIn contact in here if anyone wants to uh, anyone wants to reach out, feel free. I actually saw Alexis vote here just last week, mm -hmm. who I met when I was a senior in high school, who was the first person to tell me about optics, which is how I ended up in the optics 101 class. Mm -hmm. um, I was originally planning to be a statistics major because I just really liked numbers and math and analysis. And then I heard about optics and I was like, that sounds like a really cool <laughs> application because I never really understood what I could do with numbers. And then I totally fell in love with it. It's the coolest field. So you should, you should do there it. You she also said to me, you'll always have a job and they'll always pay you well. And that has not been wrong. <laughs> that is totally true. That is true. Thank you, Katie. I really appreciate sure. you. Uh, no problem. Nice to see you. Appreciate it. So yeah, folks, that's uh, there. You go. That was totally unsolicited. <laughs> uh, and I. It's, uh, but anyway, so uh, next question, Nick. That was a long first yeah. one, but that covered so, a lot of people, I'm sure. It's good. So along those lines, with your experience with students switching to optics, particularly in their first semester. Um, what are the, where are they most often coming from? And, you know, can you talk about how to dovetail someone's interest into optics and what sort of fields um, might be a natural marriage to go from uh, that field to optics? Sure, sure. So uh, the optics, the optics major is sort of the love child of electrical engineering and physics. Uh, and so we, certainly see that the people in who are coming into optics and are successful are like you know like Katie described her interest in statistics certainly numeracy you know having someone who enjoyed math in uh, high school is certainly going to be uh, having an advantage over someone who, who fights through math we I can tell you that we and I'm that we we get lots of people through the program for whom Math is not the reason that they're excited about optics and that they don't necessarily love the love the math, but uh, we get them through the program because there are a lot of different ways that you can contribute in the optics field and many of them do not involve any day to day manipulation of math, but in terms of moving into the program, certainly a strong math background is something that will make you feel more secure and uh, Certainly an interest, you know, hopefully you liked at least your tolerated your physics class in high school because your physics class was helping explain sort of why things happen. And if you're going to understand optics, you have to understand why light spreads out when it goes through a very small pinhole and why does it do that? And why can't you focus light down to as tiny a spot as you could, as your boss tells you, you have to focus it down to this spot, you know, when you have to know how to tell your boss that's not physically possible. It doesn't work that way. Uh, so, so having having a, a willingness to endure people teaching you the fundamentals of why light propagates through glass and through space and that kind of stuff. And yep, right, Katie is telling me, uh, telling all of us, right, that that optical physics made sense to her. And we often say, you know, optics is light. Optics is physics that you can see. And so you don't have to have a a deep mental construct to understand the way light sort of passes through an optical system because you just think about arrows pointing through it and a little later law later on you may think about waves passing through it when your con concepts are stronger so physics and math are things that work out well for people we certainly get people coming from biomedical interests if they're interested in biomedical engineering at u of r because but because medical optics is one of the four main course uh, tracks that you can go through in biomedical engineering, people who are interested in biomedical optics sometimes find after a semester or three, like, wow, oh, if um, maybe instead of, maybe I want to be an optics major and a BME minor instead of the other way around or something, or something like that, or I want to concentrate in optics by doing a major in optics and I'll take some classes in BME. So we, some, we do get people interested in it from, from that direction. That, that's something we see. But I would say generally, it's uh, it's physics, uh, engine, all branches of other branches of engineering, because people have never heard of optics when they get to U of R. Most people just don't know about it. You know, if they're lucky, like Katie was, they get told about it by by someone else who's in the program. But most people just nobody's nobody's aunt or uncle works in optics unless they live in Rochester or, or Tucson. So so you just don't have um, 
the density of people recognizing that this is a discipline. So people get here and then we, we gain majors in general. So the other way people come into the major is just through talking to their roommates and finding out that, hey, what's this thing that you, that you uh, are seeming to enjoy your Optics 101 class? You got to go to this really neat mixer with a bunch of people from industry in mid-October because we have our industrial associates program. That's when Apple, et cetera, comes out and interviews people. We do that uh, twice a year. And so maybe they hear, hey, that was really fun. I felt like I was really seeing my future as a first year student. Like I could see these companies wanting to talk to me. And I found that what I, I'm already seeing how what I'm studying will, will translate into job wise. You become aware of the companies. It, honestly, if you're a physics major, I was a physics major. You don't really learn by studying physics what you're gonna do with your skills. It doesn't mean you don't have skills. Um, but you're more of a generalist and you don't necessarily uh, feel prepared to go out into industry with your physics degree. But if you have an optics degree, you can absolutely go to graduate school, which half of our students do. Uh, but, you, but you can also go straight into industry because you already have a sense of a set of, you have a toolkit that is very hireable because very few students coming out of bachelor's degree programs in this country are prepared to do that. And uh, that's why companies pay to come to us to interview students. And that's why upon graduation, uh, basically every student who wants to have a job and has put any effort into lining up a job, they have a job. It's just reality. Like, like the person I mentioned who actually didn't have a job until November and got the job at Apple, that's, that was more pandemic-y. I mean, it's just everybody who wants to work, they work, as I say, May, you know, semiconductor processing, you know, lithography to make printed, you know, boards, all that, all those intense, all those patterns are made, you know, you, most of them at least using um, ultraviolet photons. There's all sorts of places that people just step into jobs. Everybody gets a job. It is an amazing thing to be an optics major because you're not competing with your classmates because you're all going to get jobs. You're not trying to be the more desirable person and the person to your left and to your right are going to have to find some other job because you got the good job. It's not like that. It's really not like that. The um, I want to back up and talk a little bit about graduate school. Mm -hmm. um, for I guess generally, do uh, optical engineering undergrads do they go right from uh, after undergrad or do they start working? Is it sort of a mixed bag? How long are the is the program typically? Um, what does a PhD look like? Uh, so, as I said, about half of our students do go straight to a job rather rather than into uh, uh, further schooling. Um, PhD is uh, the, the first thing, of course, I tell anyone is you're a first year student or you're a high school student. We'll talk about a PhD later. But knowing what the what the lay of the land is like. Uh, yeah, you know, PhD uh, on average, you know, five and a half to six and a half year process. And it's uh, it's a it's a deep dive and into doing some sort of research project. Most, most people may not, uh, you know, you, you might vary around a little bit, but you know, years three through six, you're really, you're trying to become the world's expert in some particular thing. You know, I have a student who was in my office this morning. We were talking about her project. She's doing a biomedical optics microscopy project, trying to figure out if you shine light through a single biological cell can you just make a quick snapshot that doesn't take an image of the cell, but lets you know the size distribution of the organelles so you could see if like the organelles are swelling in response to some chemical insult. So she's becoming like the world's expert in this particular way of trying to make a measurement, a size measurement on the internal constituents of a single cell. So you become really expert at something like that. So that's like where it lasts. It's about, about five and a half to six years. It's, it's a year of a lot of coursework and then con continuing some coursework and transitioning to being a full-time researcher. That's, that's the game. Uh, we also have a master's program, which is very popular. Uh, many of our students stay on to get a master's. And uh, so that's either a one or two year process for undergrads. Usually if they stay here for a master's, it's a one year process that they go as, as Katie did to Arizona or other graduate programs. Usually those are constructed as two year proce projects if you're not uh, at, at a, the same school you did as an undergrad but it varies. And uh, that's, that's often a good way to get a sort of leg up going into industry coming in. You certainly get more responsibility allowed to you in a, in a company if you have a master, a graduate degree.
And that's also something that sometimes if you work at a company for a while, they will often pay for you to take your master's part-time uh, on their dime. So that's another thing to think about. And not all, not all industries will do that, but certainly many industries will, uh, many optics companies have done that. Great. Can you talk a little bit about uh, senior design, please? Yes, senior design is uh, the, a capstone project that's done for all students who are earning the bachelor's degree in optical engineering. We have two tracks. Uh, one is an optics track, and they're they're identical tracks at the time for the time being. Other than that, at the end, you either do an independent research project working in someone's research lab. Uh, it's occasional that something more unusual is done with that opportunity. We do have other mechanisms, but typically you do a research project with a professor. Uh, basically, just embed yourself in a, in a project ongoing, often with other people in someone's lab. Or you can do uh, the senior design project, and then you would get an optical engineering degree. And so that's a, that's a project where we, we take in requests, as do other departments, for customers, both sort of... Um, uh, role-playing customers like a professor or a company or a real company actually wanting something done for them. And they say, hey, oh, okay, I'm the Rochester Science Museum. Um, we would like to do a certain sort of display where things light up when you do X, Y, and Z, like you step on things and, and things light up in certain ways. That was a sort of a fanciful project, but they needed someone to build the thing. And so it could be that. It, we've had companies ask for designs for lens coating. We've had this, uh, you know, anti-reflection coatings. We've had people do things for uh, like Google glasses, you know, various sorts of things that allow you to visualize certain things by uh, just putting your cell phone over your eyes. You know, that there's, there's been stuff like that. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a two semester process. You go through a lot of learning, uh, the sort of things that you'd need to do if you're doing this out in the real world. You do patent searches, you, uh, write up design documents. So it's basically just a dry run. And, uh, and everybody is super organized and well prepared and nobody has stressful last two weeks before they have to do their final presentation. And nobody doesn't have a working prototype, you know, two weeks before that never, ever happens. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's actually kind of crazy when that happens, but, uh, but which, which is everybody, every single group is terrified two weeks before uh, design day. It doesn't May. happen in the real world either. Like that. And exactly, it doesn't happen. So, so it is good practice. We're always very well prepared. <laughs> I never used to know the, I never used to understand when people would talk about deadlines and drop deadlines, but now I kind of understand the, 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 the difference there. So anyway, yeah, so it's a very realistic experience that's not unique to optics. Anyone who does a degree in, any engineering discipline here is going to learn uh, how to how to work on a team, and be totally stressed out on time, and feel like they wish they had done a lot more of their work earlier. And uh, they'll learn the difference between things that are important and things that are urgent, and that sometimes things are so important that you have to do them even before they get urgent. And so it's a good learning lesson for everybody. The advisors uh, in the Hidden Dean's office are, are aware of, especially. Um, Jim Zavislin's, uh, this is very, very important. It's just not time sensitive. Uh, yes. response, uh, with, that is much appreciated. I, I wanted to go back and ask you a question about failure. And I think that this is mm -hmm. more, I guess, of a higher ed philosophical question than an optics specific one in mm -hmm. that, you know, a lot, a lot of our high school students worry about having any weaknesses. Um, and I think it's sort of the, the, legend is that you know if you if you show weakness or if you have some sort of downside you're not going to mm -hmm. get into college you're not going to get a good job you're going to be homeless all the sort of things that go together yeah. can you talk to about how failure is a necessary part of this in your experience with that in research uh specifically in in doing research work you mean yeah yeah well uh so i'm a musician, I'm a clarinetist. And one thing I know from my upbringing is that, uh, you know, the only way to write um, a lot of good music is to write a lot of music. <laughs> and, and I think that the same is true in research that you just, you're not going to get, if you're doing anything that's difficult, it's not always going to work. And um, only the super 
only the superheroes are, are able to get a high percentage of the things that they try to get to work on the first, first iteration. So yeah, so, so it really, the, the nice thing about doing research as an undergraduate uh, in a lab where there are graduate students and, and, um, and seniors, more senior people than that, and of course some professor uh, as well, is that that's a that's a really safe place to fail? You know, we have we obviously take care of our safety rules so that you don't shine a laser into your eye or anything like that. But once the safety issues are taken out of the way, uh, apprenticeships are where you can fail safely. And research conducted correctly is sort of an ever nested set of Russian dolls. It's all about somebody's mentoring you and you're mentoring somebody. And so. It's never the wrong, it's never impossible to get on at an early stage and then fail at things because you're you're doing it under someone else's watch. It's like everyone's a parent or something like that. So don't worry about that. Uh, it if you are doing research and you feel like you're totally lost and you have no idea what's going on, probably the main question you need to calibrate is: Am I not asking for help? in the right ways, because of course you can ask for too much help and be paralyzed and feel like you need permission to breathe. And, uh, and of course you can feel like I'm afraid of my advisor or my mentor and I don't wanna bother them and they're super busy. So good mentors, make sure that students know how often to come in at, that their door, when their door is open. Electronics has helped us, you know, so many of these you know, platforms now where you can deposit your, your questions and say, hey, professor, I'm not trying to intrude on you this instant, but I need feedback on this. Can you help me? Um, that has helped a lot. My, my, my uh, research group uses, you know, things like Slack and Teams in order to make, to have a good, easy way to remember like what was going on in that conversation and not miss, not letting ideas die. So yes, you will fail. But the point should be that you have a context within which you failed. I mean, if you destroy something in the lab, somebody at some level should be able to say, you know what, uh, that wasn't you who destroyed that. That was the lab broke that. And it only in their extreme circumstances will that really be a blame thing. So you shouldn't be afraid to fail at research. You can't, you can't get better because you don't understand what you're doing until you do some things uh, wrong. I mean, it really, it really is like that. So one of the uh, parts of the full spectrum series that I wanted to ask each department um, is about mm -hmm. the next frontier. So Ed Hagem in his commencement speech talks about, uh, which I think is one of the best parts is, is uh, he worked really hard, but he also caught his wave, right? He got into plastics after World War II. Uh, and he said, I was looking out for this wave and that was part of the reason I was successful. Do you think there's an element of optics that is the next wave that people should be getting on? Um, and what do, you, like, what do you think that might be? Yeah, um, there's, a, there's a couple. I'll just, I'll select uh, from, so, you know, from the list, obviously the list is, is, is there, it obviously maps onto that. Um, so very, high precision, very small, dense, like nano photonics, like so nano is a thing and optics is part of that nano world. So, so taking uh, light sources that used to be big and being able to make that same amount of brightness but come out of a much smaller source that you can carry it around with you. Like that's, that, that, that's a big thing. Uh, definitely, uh, Definitely, definitely all things having to do with quantum. Quantum is another big thing. So anyone who wants to get involved in quantum computing, quantum cryptography, quantum signaling, that's, so the nano and, and quantum definitely go very closely together. Um, it's hard, it's hard, it's really hard to, you know, pick the favorite children there, but I, those, those are two technological areas. And then I would say vision science, just in general between making, you know, that that, that enclo encloses both vis um, augmented and visual um, and virtual rather reality, but it, it, it also means understanding the way the visual system works. That's, that's just a hugely robust area and there's so much, and, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm not even bringing, and 
the eye is also a system where you know you can make insertions, you can do intraocular, you know, lenses. There's a whole bunch of different manipulations that we can do to give people better vision for longer. So yeah, I mean, so it, it's, it's helpful to have those keywords like nano and quantum and vision science because when you know, hopefully, where we do have prospective students or parents, you know, yeah. watching this, this is a good place for them to sort of fall, like I said, the ocean that they can. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. No, those those are those are certainly some of some of the big ones, but uh, yeah, it's really it's it's hard it's hard to say. Obviously, as a biomedical optics person, I want to say that the uh, revolutions in microscopy have all and and other sorts of high resolution imaging and uh, and just augment, just providing better ways for uh, doctors and other health professionals to make their decisions. Uh, I mean, well, I'll just tell people anecdotally, I'm having a conversation now uh, with a guy I, I work on an NIH grant with, where like the proposal uh, if, in rough terms is, hey, can we help someone in a doctor's office help the doctor, the PCP, to make a recommendation of whether this person ought to get this more expensive test. Mm -hmm. So, you know, something cheap with optics uh, allows you to, to take it to the next level. Like, should you, you know, maybe if 10% if of the people get told to get that test who didn't need it, but like if 90% of the people who needed that test get that test, that saves you from having to send everybody to get that test, which is not cost-effective. But if you can find the cohort that needs that more sophisticated test, that's that's really important. Oh, and I didn't even tell, I didn't even say in my list, but this clues into what what you you mentioned, Nick, that uh, in the field of biomedical optics and optics in general, the the fact that a cell phone has all of the functions that it has in it means that I can get a blood smear or any sort of biological specimen from somebody in a remote village somewhere, someone, so a resources poor region. I can clap that, I can take that, that blood smear or whatever, like a, like a pap smear, right? I can put it on the camera of my phone, which I've got some little 3D printed thing that clips on with an auxiliary lens that makes it into a high resolution, decent microscope. And then I can upload that to somebody across the world who's gonna interpret what they're looking at in the pap smear. And the reason this is so important for low resource areas in the world, and some of those low resource areas are in our own country, is that, if you're if you've got some traveling clinic that's going around to help people, you uh, if you're traveling around with more sophisticated equipment that you take a measurement on somebody and you say I'll be back in a week I'll come back to your village I'll come back to your urban area and I will give you the results of your test you might never find that person again because if they're not a population that's reliably going to be there so uh, the ability to to get data that's meaningful and quickly understood. And you can tell the person at that moment, you need to get a mammogram or, or we've got the mammogram here. We're gonna take it now. You know, th th these are huge issues in global health. And so optics plays an enormous role because that's, that's the laboratory that everybody can already bring to people without having to do a lot. And you know, most other sophisticated equipment is not a consumer grade device. We have a consumer grade device that can do an enormous amount of stuff. And that's, that's a, another thing that I would be remiss not to say is a huge uh, growth area. So if you wanna go into low resource areas, uh, getting technology brought to them, especially for health, but also for other things, this is a, a great, great field to be interested in. I, I've found every year that I'm here and the longer I spend in higher ed, the students are thinking, undergraduate students are thinking more and more globally from the beginning. So that is, mm -hmm. I think, one of the, the, the best ways to think about sort of how these technologies can affect the world. And, and, and the idea that, you know, we do have students who want to save the world, but understanding that they're very, you know, finite, significant parts that they can do. So absolutely. Um, I, absolutely. I do that. <laughs> um, it looks like we are about out of time. Um, we have all of our questions that have been submitted. Um, Dr. Berger, thank you so much for doing this and for being able to provide insight uh, for uh, both students and parents and prospective students and alum, uh, all of which who wanted to know more about this, um, but don't necessarily have the capability to, to go to a class or, or to be able to access this. So um, we will be posting um, this video on our Facebook page and Instagram and YouTube. Uh, so it will be around. Um, like so we'll also put Dr. Uh, Berger's um, 
information in there um, so you can learn more about him. Uh, Katie, thank you for also uh, giving a perspective. Um, yeah, having, thanks for letting uh, me crash. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. I mean, hey, hey, being able to, to literally see what your life can be like, I think a lot of times the students often appreciate that. It's so. glamorous. <laughs> there you go. Well, I will stop the broadcast now. I want to remind you that next week, Friday, October 15th, 2 to 3 p.m., we will be uh, having chemical engineering uh, talk about what they do. Um, thank you for being here. If you have questions, please put them in the comments on the Facebook page, and we hope you all have a great weekend. Great.